Today's reading is Daniel chapter 6, verses 10 to 23. Now, when Daniel learned that the decree had been published, he went home to his upstairs room where the windows opened toward Jerusalem. Three times a day, he got down on his knees and prayed, giving thanks to his God, just as he had done before. Then these men went as a group and found Daniel praying and asking God for help. So they went to the king and spoke to him about his royal decree. Did you not publish a decree that during the next 30 days, anyone who prays to any god or human being except to you, your majesty, would be thrown into the lion's den? The king answered, The decree stands in accordance with the law of the Medes and the Persians, which cannot be repealed. Then they said to the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, your majesty, or to the decree you put in writing. He still prays three times a day. When the king heard this, he was greatly distressed. He was determined to rescue Daniel and made every effort until sundown to save him. Then the men went as a group to King Darius and said to him, Remember, your majesty, that according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, no decree or edict that the king issues can be changed. So the king gave the order, and they brought Daniel and threw him into the lion's den. The king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you serve continually, rescue you. A stone was brought and placed over the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the rings of his nobles, so that Daniel's situation might not be changed. Then the king returned to his palace and spent the night without eating and without any entertainment being brought to him, and he could not sleep. At the first light of dawn, the king got up and hurried to the lion's den. When he came near the den, he called to Daniel in an anguished voice, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to rescue you from the lions? Daniel answered, May the king live forever. My God sent his angel, and he shut the mouths of the lions. They have not hurt me, because I was found innocent in his sight, nor have I ever done any wrong before you, your majesty. The king was overjoyed and gave orders to lift Daniel out of the den. And when Daniel was lifted from the den, no wound was found on him, because he had trusted in his God. May God bless the reading, hearing, and understanding of his word. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, open our hearts and our minds to your word today with the message you have for us here in this place and in this time. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So this is the last Sunday in our Old Testament 101 stories, and today we feature Daniel in the lion's den. So we've been with uh, David and Goliath, we've been with Queen Esther, we've been with Abraham, and all of these stories along the way have some different common themes that remain with them. And in all of these different stories, whether it's Esther, um, David and Goliath, and today Daniel, one of the things they have in common is that often the people 
about whom we hear these stories are finding themselves in positions of influence, in positions of having an opportunity, even at great risk to themselves, to be a witness to their faith, a witness to their God, a witness to what they believe God would call them to witness to, even if in the situation they find themselves in around them, they do so at, at great risk to themselves, and today is no different. But before I get into Daniel, I want to take us back a little bit to Jeremiah, briefly. Because in, in Jeremiah 29, so in Jeremiah we hear in part the story of the nation of Israel being conquered, divvied up, divided up, and many, many of the people of Israel being uh, marched over to Babylon. King Nebuchadnezzar, they've conquered Israel, and so now one of the things they do to kind of enhance or maintain that sense of power and control over this great nation is to divide them up. And so they go into Israel and they take some of the greatest minds, the greatest artisans, um, the wisest people, the most creative, uh, and, and they march them back to Babylon. This, in the course of history, does a great number of things. It enhances the land of Babylon. It is seen by the conquerors of Israel to weaken the nation of Israel because as they take some of the people of Israel out, they bring people of Babylon in. And this becomes ultimately an odd, unique, blended history of nations and peoples. And the Israelites that find themselves in captivity, in exile in Babylon, Jeremiah the prophet writes to them a letter and says, To the remaining elders among the exiles, to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar have taken into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon, this was after King Jeconiah and the Queen Mother, the court officials, the leaders of Judah and Jerusalem, the artisans, and the smiths have departed from Jerusalem. The letter was sent by the hand of Elisa, son of Shaphan, and Jeremiah, son of Hilkiah. For thus says the Lord, Jeremiah says. Oh, let me back it up a minute here, sorry. Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the exiles whom I have sent, into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Take wives and have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there and do not decrease, but seek the welfare of the city where I have sent you into exile and pray to the Lord on its behalf, for in its welfare you will find your welfare. For thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, do not let the prophets and diviners who are among you deceive you, and don't listen to the dreams that they dream, for it is a lie that they are prophesying to you in my name. I did not send them, says the Lord. For thus says the Lord, only when Babylon's 70 years are completed will I visit you and I will fulfill to you my promise and bring you back to this place. For surely I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans for your welfare and not for harm to give you a future with hope goes on to say, when you search for me, you will find me if you seek me with all your heart. Not if, but when. And so here, they are taken into exile. Now, when we pick up this particular story of Daniel and the lion's den, or the entire book of Daniel, the first six chapters have to do with... So they're, living, they're still living in a foreign land when we hear this story of Daniel. And when we hear this entire book and the account of Daniel, Daniel, while in this foreign land, and in the course of several different kings, finds himself in a place of trust, in a place of leadership, in a place of influence, in this foreign land, where he is able then to give witness to God, in a place where they don't know God, and Several times in the course of this witnessing to God, Daniel puts himself in what could be harm's way. 
early on in the book of Daniel, when they're about to uh, share in food and share in meal, and these are, are foods that would not be along the lines of what Daniel has committed himself to and what many Israelites committed themselves to, but to kind of turn down the fancy meal at the king's palace is not always, it, it could be thought to be rude or inconsiderate or unwelcoming. And so Daniel steps up and says to the master of the palace, for these reasons, I can't and won't partake of this. Can we find another option? And because he has found himself in favor with the, the, the palace master and, and eventually, as we read, of, of the different kings there, God makes a way, and God makes a way. And Daniel continues to witness to the love, the grace, and the power of his God to those who don't know his God. And they begin to recognize Daniel as someone who lives with tremendous integrity, someone who lives with great faithfulness to God while at the same time serving in this foreign land, in places of trust and in leadership without being while standing his ground without um, being confrontational. And more and more, Daniel is recognized by leaders and authorities as someone who is trustworthy, even though they're from a foreign land. Even though, why would you promote a foreigner to these positions of leadership when they're not local, they're not native, and they have beliefs that people know commonly know that Daniel is a person of prayer, a person of great devotion to his God, who shares and witnesses to the faithfulness of his God to all these people. Why would you bring a foreigner up the ranks to places of leadership and power except that by the fact that this man has demonstrated himself to be a person of tremendous integrity, great wisdom. He's interpreted visions for the, for the leaders, and, and they begin to see Daniel's God really working through him. And we find in the midst of this, as we come to the passage for today, and we talk about Daniel and the lion's den, there are those others in the leadership of Babylon who have probably been striving for these positions of leadership their whole lives that maybe have felt themselves to be part of families of power or they've been well connected they have they've been excellent perhaps self-directed self-motivated politicians who had a goal of being eventually in those places of power. And we find in another, in, this happens in other places through Daniel, but in this particular one, with King Darius, King Darius appoints Daniel to a place of high and great leadership, trustworthiness, integrity, and there are those who really wanted that for themselves, and they begin to plot and they begin to scheme. Something has to be done about this. Rather than go at David confrontationally or negatively, they go to the king in large groups. All of these leaders and secondary leaders and tertiary leaders, they all go to the king. And basically what they're doing is they're, they're buttering up the king. They're making sure the king has their full support and encouragement. They go to the king and remind the king about, you know, we, do, we still have a lot of these people that are foreign in our land. And we have to remind them that there are certain expectations and and at one point, a king has formed a, a golden image. And it's the only image, an image of the king, that people are allowed to bow down to or to worship and that kind of thing. And this whole time, these connivers in the background are like, we know David doesn't pray to no golden image. Did I say David? Daniel. I meant Daniel. Thanks. Well, they, never mind. So they know Daniel prays to his God. He supports the king, encourages the king, lifts up the king, but he prays to and worships his God. He doesn't bow to a golden image. He doesn't pray to a golden image. 
And of course, these connivers have witnessed Daniel, who out in the open, with his, with his, his doors and windows open at his home, he prays to God. Every day, the scripture says that Daniel prays to God. David is in communion and in community with his God, the living God. And they see this and they know this and they're like, I know what we'll do. So they go to the king and they say, you know, king, you wrote this proclamation that for these 30 days, anyone who were to bow or pray to any image other than you, well, they, they get thrown to the lions. And it's the law. And we, of course, we adore you and we bow to you, but what, what would happen, king? What would happen, king, if, if we were to observe or if we were to come to know another, say, citizen in our community who perhaps we even observed praying to another, bowing or kneeling to another? Certainly, your majesty, what what would be called of us to do if we observed this behavior from any one of your subjects? Wink, wink, nudge, nudge to one another. And the king is, is put in a, in a place where he said, well, I wrote the decree. And we all know that in this place, in this time, if I write the decree, if I place the law in writing, not even I myself for this period of time can undo it. Not even I myself can reverse it because it's the law. And they begin to snicker and they begin to grin and they're kind of like, we have, your majesty, we have observed this behavior. We have observed a member of the community who has been bowing and praying to one other than you. And his name is Daniel. And immediately King Darius is like, oh. Because Darius trusts Daniel. Daniel has been a good leader. He has been a good advisor. One might even say he's become a friend of the king. But now these sneaky buggers have walked in and said, yeah, but you can't really ignore your law. You can't really exclude anyone from being subject to the law. And Darius sweats and, and, and worries and is like, I've got, how can I what can I do? Is there anything I can do to protect Daniel? He was much distressed, the scripture says. He was determined to save Daniel. And until the sun went down, he made every effort to rescue him. And then the conspirators came to the king and said to him, Know, O king, that it is a law of the Medes and Persians that no interdict or ordinance, no law that the king establishes can be changed. <coughs> now in that moment... I have a thought. He's the king. <laughs> Shut up. Maybe he could, but the king is abiding by those very laws that he himself considers himself subject to. The king gave the command, and Daniel was brought and thrown into the den of lions, and the king said to Daniel, May your God, whom you faithfully serve, deliver you. And then the, the den of the lions was covered with a stone and sealed with the king's signet ring. The king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. No food was brought to him. Sleep fled from him. There was no entertainment to be held. And so think about that. This king who has to enforce this law, who has sort of kind of been tricked into something, he begins to respond to this particular need and challenge the same way he knows Daniel might, in fasting, perhaps even in lifting his voice in prayer to this God that he doesn't necessarily know as his God, but even he begins to lean on the witness of Daniel to trust in this God as he says to Daniel in the lion's den before the stone is put on there. May that same God to whom you have been so faithful and to whom you have given witness protect you. Even this king, even what one might say is an unbelieving king, invokes the name of God and says, may this God protect you. And then at daybreak, the king must have eventually found sleep king gets up, hurried to the den of lions, 
came near to the den, and before he moved the stone, before he removed his seal, before he did anything, he cried out anxiously to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you faithfully serve, been able to deliver you from the lions? And, the Daniel, said, and Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they would not hurt me, because I was found blameless before God, and also before you, king. I have done no wrong. And then the king was exceedingly glad, commanded that Daniel be taken up out of the den. And so Daniel was taken up out. No harm could be found on him because he had trusted in his God. And then the king commanded that all those who had accused Daniel, who had set up Daniel, who had betrayed Daniel, they were to be thrown to the lion's den. As I read this story, you know, we've heard the story of Daniel in the lion's den as kids, in kids' songs, probably in vacation Bible schools over the years or in Sunday school lessons over the years. And so what do you hear in this story of Daniel and the lion's den? And I've always thought about the protection Daniel received, the safety he received, the, the jealousy inherent in some aspects of, of leadership and rule. And it's been there the whole time, but I've never really focused as much on it as I did this time, is this, un, this unwavering faithfulness, this unwavering witness that Daniel gives to his God. Not just by proclaiming and teaching and telling people about God, but his witness to God is in his integrity. His witness to God is in how he lives what the scriptures say is an exemplary life. That word exemplary thinks of example. The example that Daniel lives out in this foreign land where there are people that are jealous of him, where there are people that are following him, and where there are kings that have relied on him and brought him to position of leadership. It's Daniel's witness. When we become members of a United Methodist Church, we... We pledge our, um, uh-oh, there's five things. Our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. What is our witness to the world around us of our faith and our belief and our trust in God? What is our witness to one another in our service to God and living lives that are exemplary, living lives that give an example of what it means to be a follower of Jesus Christ. It's not always about just telling people about Jesus and telling people about what Jesus has done in our lives and meant in our lives. That's all very, very important. But sometimes one of the best things we can do to live an exemplary life, to make an example of our Christianity and lift up our faith is to simply live a good example of caring for others no matter what, of coming alongside others in times of celebration, in times of sadness, in times of frustration, and in times of challenge, of offering the same unconditional love, grace, and mercy to others that God extends to us, so that as people see our witness and see how we live our lives, they might begin to come to understand some of the why behind the how we live our lives as we give a witness to others. What is the witness of this church on this corner of these two roads across from that high school and in this neighborhood? Not necessarily building a reputation around programs and things like that, but building a reputation around relationship. And so what does it mean for us, like Daniel, to bear witness to all those around us, to coworkers, to friends, to family, to people we live in community with? What does that look like for us? As we are witnesses of the living word of God found in Jesus Christ in particular for us. Let us pray. 
Lord, help us to live faithful lives. lives. Help us to live in witness to your love and grace and mercy, in witness to your faithfulness. Help us to be more faithful. As we have an opportunity to engage people in our neighborhood through things like Vacation Bible School, through our fireside fellowships, just to say, hi, neighbor, how are you? Help us, Lord, to be aware of the witness we give every day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.